Well, hey folks, welcome back to another Timber Talk Tuesday. I'm Ricky McLean with Woodworks. Have you heard about the use of mass timber in affordable housing construction? It's no secret right now that the U.S. is in the midst of a desperate need for more housing in general, especially affordable housing. Can a new and innovative material like mass timber be used to solve some of those challenges? What happens if the mass timber comes at a cost premium? Does affordable housing have to be built using the cheapest materials possible? Is there room for a new material like mass timber? If you're interested in some or perhaps all of these topics, I recommend you stick around for today's video. I think it's going to be a good one. Now, to help address a lot of these questions, I thought what better way to do so than talking by somebody who's actually done one of these projects, a mass timber affordable housing project here in the States. So I recently had a conversation with Renee Funston. Renee is a development manager with the Capital Area Development Agency, which is in Sacramento, California. And as of the time of this recording, they're just wrapping up construction on a five-story project called Sunrisa in Sacramento. Now, Sunrisa is a regulated affordable housing project. It's providing 58 affordable housing units in the 40 to 60% AMI income range. It's receiving financing from 4% tax credits, tax-exempt bonds, a state HCD loan, and a capital area development agency loan as well. It's utilizing CLT floors and roofs on top of panelized light wood frame walls for a five-story from grade mass timber affordable housing project. So one of the first questions that I asked Renee in our conversation is just to briefly explain some of the general challenges that affordable housing projects encounter not tied specifically to the use of mass timber, but just what are some of the constraints that they face on a day-to-day -day basis when doing affordable housing development? Cost is always the key issue. There's a lot more demand for affordable housing, as we know, that by far outpaces the availability of public financing. And especially in California, we have a huge housing crisis issue. So one of the central affordable housing tools has historically been the 4% tax credits which historically have been non-competitive and were awarded through an over-the-counter application. Although with the Certainty and Disaster Relief Tax Relief Act of 2020, they set the tax credit 4% floor to actually 4%. So as background, the 4% name was actually just representing the designation type. So you have 4% tax credits and 9% tax credits. In the IRS formula for calculating the value of these 4% tax credits, it's actually floated below 4%. So when Congress established the 4% floor, this actually flooded the market with tax credits, which lowered the value of those credits to developers and investors. So pairing more demand for affordable housing financing, plus a lower value for these tax credits, plus syndicators becoming more selective in choosing those projects to fund, it created greater financing gaps. So there's a lot more projects that are seeking 4% tax credits and every point on the application counts. And then the funding criteria changes every year based on political priorities, such as designating more units for people transitioning from homelessness. So then of course, funding criteria across different programs also don't align. So Developers are constantly trying to rework your project to complete your funding stack. And all the while you're performing these program gymnastics, we also have the same issues as market rate developers, rising construction costs, supply chain issues, and labor shortages. So those are some of the general hurdles that any affordable housing project is going to face as it tries to create its development. Next, I asked Renee, what happens specifically when you try to bring in new materials such as mass timber, something that's new to them as the development agency, something that was also new to most of the design and construction team? How does a new and innovative material that can potentially provide some benefits, but how does the introduction of that new material create additional challenges or hurdles specifically on an affordable housing project? So trying to build anything innovative requires additional extreme care and attention from the entire design and construction team because parties are unfamiliar with the new construction method. So, for example, with Sunrisa, we were part of the 2019 California Building Code, which allowed CLT for gravity loading bearing use, but not for lateral. So that is for horizontal, but not vertical application. So to permit this novel design, the team had to work through the alternative means and methods review AMMR process. 
And this caused additional schedule delays because of extensive reviews by all parties, including introducing the system and explaining the differences to the traditional framing. And it was our architect and GC's first project using CLT. And so similarly, the team had to recurrently introduce and explain the product and process to subcontractors and vendors. And then additionally, being affordable housing, we're subject to Section 11B in the California Building Code, which specifies building requirements for quote unquote public housing, which is extremely prescriptive and defining precise dimensions. So all of these things really put you in like a really tight box. And a lot of developers trying to reduce costs, expedite the process and reduce headaches and ultimately build more housing units right now. I mean, going with mass timber in a novel and a novel con construction method like CLT creates just a lot more layers of complication in this field that's already fraught with oversight, regulation, and compliance requirements. Now, of course, it's not all challenges and hurdles when it comes to mass timber and affordable housing. Mass timber can leverage some benefits and provide some real tangible benefits. So that's what I asked Renee about next, is what are the specific tangible benefits that using mass timber in an affordable housing project can provide? One of the major benefits, um, if we wanna just look at you know construction ease, timeline ease, is that CLT specifically, is, it's essentially a prefabricated material. So when there's a lot of care and attention to the upfront preparation process, we reduce the actual framing time. And so this is really beneficial for our project, which was framing during the winter time. And so with Sunrisa, we use the CLT for the horizontal components, and then we use prefabricated walls in, con in conjunction. And so our contractor had done a lot of upfront research, working with the different subcontractors, getting all of the pieces directly lined up. And they also got then got really familiar with the framing system itself. And they used a crane and they were able to place a floor of CLT panels in one day, which is a huge time savings compared to four or five days per floor with conventional TGI. And this is significantly faster than concrete, which of course requires formwork, shoring, reinforcement with steel. And this also saved us costs as far as our general conditions for the contractor and helped us in meeting some completion deadlines. So this mix of using the prefabrication CLT and the walls resulted in precise and high quality lumber. And then of course there's the environmental benefits of easing insulation, reducing time cleaning and straightening up the walls and reducing on-site waste. I think there's a perception too with some people that an affordable housing project has to be built using the cheapest materials possible, the cheapest means possible. Oftentimes the use of mass timber could create a cost premium. Now a lot of projects have been able to overcome that cost premium through leveraging the other benefits that mass timber can provide, but strictly looking at the cost of the materials, if an affordable housing project uses mass timber and it does create a cost premium on the material side of things, does that create a no-go situation as immediately that strike out the possibility of mass timber in affordable housing? And, and this was the question that I asked Renee next. Certainly. I mean, if you're going to go with any innovative construction method, period, you need to build in some buffers in your pro forma, expecting that there will be cost overruns. A lot of these things are going to be really unique to the client and the design and construction team and their motivations for doing the project. A lot of affordable housing doesn't have to be just the bottom line, profit driven. So for example, with Sunrisa, we're a really unique client. We are, um, we're a joint powers authority between the city and the state. And we have a very specific charge with creating with creating housing that's accessible to a wide range of income levels within the central city and to maintain a vi the vitality and urban character of the 24 hour community around the state capital. And we still get tax increment financing, which we reinvest in the neighborhood. So while certainly there were cost overruns with Sunrisa that were unanticipated, there were still ways for us to work things around from other, just being able to pull from other buckets of financing. And then also in California, there was just, and I mean, across the country with this particular period in time and dealing with post pandemic, there was also additional bond cap. So that made it really 
a lot more beneficial to finishing this project and making things pencil in the end. Um, as I also said, we were done through the governor's executive order for affordable housing development. And that gave us our actual land for just $1 a year. So that also helped save on the costs for using CLT. And so when you pair these unique characteristics and then just the benefits of how stunning CLT looks from having the added height, how warm it looks and feels and opening up a space for us, livability, longevity of the actual living unit and the benefits overall that's gonna bring to the neighborhood, those were our most deciding factors. Then of course, the environmental benefits. It was a no brainer for us that we wanted to use CLT. And plus we had a really dedicated, as I said, architect and contractor, and everyone was as together a joint dedicated team felt a sense of camaraderie to building this product that would be beautiful and into the future. Well, there you have it, folks. I hope that you enjoyed that conversation with Renee. I hope that it clarified some of the questions that often surround the use of mass timber in affordable housing and perhaps just affordable housing questions in general. I do think this is a topic where there tends to be some misunderstanding, misperception, commonly misunderstood topics. And so hopefully today's video clarifies some of that. I do also want to mention that Renee is going to be on a panel discussion talking about mass timber in affordable housing projects, the realities the benefits, the challenges at the 2023 International Mass Timber Conference in Portland, Oregon at the end of March in 2023. So if you're attending and want to hear more from Renee, hear more about this project, I suggest that you attend that panel discussion as well as hear from some other really leading architects and developers in the space of mass timber affordable housing and, and helping solve a lot of the challenges that, that we face as a country in terms of housing solutions. Well, that's it for today's video. I thank you so much for making it to the end. And until next time, we'll see you later.